Organizers uh, for putting together uh, this lovely event. So, yeah, what I'm mostly going to be talking about uh, today are questions about finite quotients of three manifold groups. So, fundamental groups of three manifolds. And for me um, today, uh, oh, I should say, and so yeah, most of what I'm gonna talk about today, say is joint work with Will Solon. Um, and my three manifolds are gonna be uh, compact, what people call closed uh, oriented, Three manifolds, so without boundary. And these three manifold groups um, are their fundamental groups. So uh, some examples of the kind of three manifolds I'm talking about in their fundamental groups are we could have the three torus whose fundamental group is Z cubed, or we could have S2 cross a circle with um, fundamental group Z, or we could have S3. So these are all compact oriented three manifolds. This one, S3 is trivial fundamental group. Um, and the uh, kind of question I'm going to ask is, What finite groups can be quotients of pi one of n, so the fundamental group of some three manifold, in what combinations? All right, and I'm going to make this question more precise uh, as I go along, but that's just the, the sort of motivating question. Now I'm going to, to uh, take a little bit of a uh, tangent uh, to explain how I got interested in this question. Also, maybe connecting it a little more uh, to the to the spirit of this conference. So, um, if we consider a two manifold, a compact oriented two manifold. Examples of those can also be realized as algebraic curves over the complex numbers. Um, but if we instead, um, take an algebraic curve over a finite field. All right, so that's a sort of awkward picture of, uh, of that. Uh, an algebraic curve over a finite field behaves in some important ways um, like a three-dimensional object because, for example, it has the, the tau cohomology uh, and Poincaré duality, you know, an analog of Poincaré duality uh, as a three-dimensional 
um, object. And that is because uh, that is because the finite field is adding a dimension um, in the way it, it's behaving sort of like, like a circle. So you have something that maybe is in the spirit of kind of this kind of three manifold. It's acting like a circle. And I'll just say that the extensions of the finite field, we know that there is a extension of degree r for every r, they behave exactly like the covering spaces of the circle that would be given by sort of r, an r-fold uh, circle spinning around mapping, uh, mapping to the circle. So this sort of adds, adds plus one dimension to this story and is how this becomes um, a, uh, a three-dimensional object. All right, so, um, Th this connection, um, not okay. So that not between these objects and these two-dimensional objects, but the fact that these behave like three-dimensional objects is what um, got me interested in this question of three manifold groups. And so here, um, so in work um, in progress with Will Sowen, and this builds a lot on previous work of mine with Yuan Liu and David Zerg Brown. Um, so for a finite group gamma, we determine the distribution of fundamental groups of curves over finite fields. So this is as C ranges over curves over FQ. And where does the finite group come in? Gamma covers of P1 over FQ. Um, and then this is sort of as Q goes to infinity first and also the genus of the curves go to infinity. So we, we so I'm sort of unraveling the story backwards. We um, got interested in three manifolds because we were interested in this question about the distribution of fundamental groups of algebraic curves over FQ that are sort of similarly behaved um, a type of object and we got and we were also interested in that because of another analogy so of algebraic curves over fq also um, uh, have an analogy to another type of object to number fields uh, so these are finite extensions of the rationals and <sighs> The function fields of these curves um, are like number fields and they're, they're both uh, global fields and they fit into this picture of number theory, which we can often do over global fields. But also, um, again, number fields, their tell cohomology has a, uh, you know, a three-dimensional analog of point gray duality. So they also, in a certain cohomological way, behave like three manifolds. And so, um, they're also part of this, uh, this connection and motivation. And so part of our um, interest in trying to understand the distribution of these um, fundamental groups of algebraic curves over FQ was so that it would lead to um, conjectures for the distribution of and of the fundamental groups here. Uh, and this, in fact, if instead of the fundamental group, uh, you just cared about the H1 or the abelianization of the fundamental group, that's the class groups of um, the number fields. And we, in fact, already have a paper out on the archive about our 
conjectures for those distributions. And in particular, one of the, the points of those conjectures is how they correct earlier conjectures of Cohen, Lindstrom, Martinet, in particular in the presence of roots of unity. Um, right, so that's, um, uh, that's kind of how I um, got, you know, uh, got into this, this question um, about, about trying to understand the uh, distribution of fundamental groups, at, you know, what, what's possible uh, for fundamental groups of three manifolds, because I was interested in this question and there are all these, these beautiful analogies and understanding each sort of piece of, of uh, these connections can help you understand uh, the other. And one of the things um, that happened already that you can see um, in, our, in our conjectures for the distribution of class groups, which are the abelianization of this fundamental group, is that there are certain things that are possible and certain things that are not um, uh, possible. And that's one of the, the, the big changes from the previous conjectures of um, Cohen, Lindstrom, Martinet, where they sort of conjectured everything, you know, happens with some positive probability is some things are possible and some things um, are not. All right, so now um, I want to get back, get back to, um, uh, uh, to three manifolds and get back to making this, this question more precise and give you a sense of the flavor of you know what what could be going on with this some things you know what does it look like some things are possible and some things are not um, so let me give one more maybe slightly more interesting so back to three manifolds I was I had some running list of examples there um, let me build you a slightly more interesting three manifold so if I take a genus G handle body, and I take two copies of it. And so this is a, right now, each of these is a three-dimensional manifold with boundary. It has this two-dimensional boundary. It's like the solid donut. And so you, if I take two copies, and then I identify the boundaries just by the identity map, Now, once I glue together those boundaries, I now have a, just a regular old three-dimensional manifold without boundary. Um, and this has, um, it's fundamental group, the free group on G generators. So free on G generators. So that tells you in terms of what's possible. So any finite group, can be a quotient of, you know, of some three manifold group and really emphasizes why the interesting part of this is the, this in what combination. Um, all right. So. I like examples, so we'll have another, another, another example um, uh, of a of a three manifold we can get by identifying some boundaries. Um, so here's how we're going to get this M. Okay, let's see how I can. We're going to take a dodecahedron, which I will attempt to. To sketch <laughs> poorly, sorry. <laughs> All right. Hopefully, your mental image of a dodecahedron is better than what I can draw. Okay. So we take a dodecahedron. Um, and now think of a solid dodecahedron. So again, it's a three manifold with boundary. And if I can somehow identify the boundary, um, 
then I can make a three manifold without boundary. So I'm going to take each face and identify it with glue it to the opposite face, identify it with the opposite face. Now, if you do that, it's not quite obvious how things should line up because um, the pentagon behind the each one you're looking at is 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 not exactly aligned. So you need to like do the minimal possible twist, say the minimal possible uh, counterclockwise twist to get each um, each face lined up with the other. So identify each face with the opposite sort of after the pi over five twist. Um, and when you do this, you get a three manifold that is known as the Poincaré homology sphere. Uh, and it's uh, fundamental group uh, is of order 120. It's called the binary icosahedral group. And it also, I mean, it happens to be SL2, F5. Um, so this is a finite, is a finite group um, that is a, uh, that is a three manifold group. Oh no. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Where is the. Okay. I guess I, I threw that up with too much vigor and it was behind this one. Okay. All right. All right. So now that question up there. Um, This is a, a more precise thing you could ask. Given finite groups G and H, um, is there a three manifold group with G as a quotient? but not H. So for every finite group G and H, that's a precise question. It has an answer, it's either yes or no, and it will depend on, on G and H, certainly. Um, so since we have a bunch of examples, we can, or we can, you know, say, uh, give, start to give some, some answers uh, to this question. Okay, let me start with the silliest. Uh, Answer, there's a silly no, which is that if H itself is a quotient of G, then no. All right, because then if you have G as a quotient, you have H as a quotient. Um, all right, okay, that's a, a, here's a sort of an easy case of a yes answer. Um, so, uh, for example, if G is SL2 F5 and H is GL2 F5, is there a three manifold group with G as a quotient but not H? And this is a yes because I gave you an example right here of a three manifold that just, you know, that's its entire fundamental group. And this is a bigger group. So it has, this is a quotient itself. And then it doesn't have this big, bigger group. Or we could say like G equals S2 and H equals S3. Um, and then take, say, you know, and then take one of our examples there, these abelian groups like, um, Z cubed and Z even, which both have S2 as a quotient, but not S3 because it's not abelian. And so these are sort of easy by just example of some um, uh, known three manifold that gives that, um, 
gives that construction. So here are some less obvious answers. And so these um, come from our work on finite quotients of three manifolds. Uh, so here's a no. So I'm going to build a group as a semi-direct product. It's the semi-direct product of SL2F3 with F3 squared, where SL2F3 acts on F3 squared exactly how you expect by it being a matrix group there. Um, and the statement here is that if this G is a quotient of some three manifold group, then H, which is going to be a similar group, except I'm going to take two copies of F, F3 squared, and SL2F3 is just going to act on each of them separately uh, in the way that you expect. And this is a bigger group, okay, than this is a quotient of pi 1m. All right, so this. Um, this is, uh, is, I hope, not obvious. Um, it's, right, and it's a, it's a no, so it's not by example. Like, this is a, you know, a theorem about three manifold groups that says whenever they have this group as a quotient, like, they must be larger. There must be more to them. In particular, they have to have this larger group as a quotient. They sort of can't stop there. Um, And, and here is an example um, of a yes. I mean, somehow to make a yes interesting, you kind of want to have some infinite family statement uh, because for, for any one particular example, you can always just like point to, to some, hope to point to some three manifold. Um, all right, so this is going to involve this group another semi-direct product and take the quaternion group, just the quaternion group on eight elements. That's the quaternion group acting on Z mod three cross Z mod five. The quaternion group has two characters, the plus or minus one, and just have it act on Z mod three via one of them and Z mod five via the other. So this is another group of, um, of order 120. Um, and the statement here that I'm going to make is, I really, okay, I, I don't want to squeeze, uh, so I will make it on the next board. So for each n, there exists a three manifold um, that has uh, G has this group G, this group of order 120 as a quotient. Okay, so far, uh, well, I haven't used N and it's not that interesting because of this example, um, but no other um, quotients of order less than or equal to n. Now, I had to put no other quotients in, uh, in quotes because, of course, if it has this group as a quotient, it has all of that group's quotients as a quotient. So what is no other quotients means, of course, except for the quotients of G itself. Okay. And so, I mean, in particular, this means that if you take this group G and you take any group H that's not a quotient of G, then the answer to this question is yes. Um, uh, you can have, have, um, 
have this, this is called an example of a generalized quaternion group. You can have this generalized quaternion group um, as a quotient, um, but, um, but no other quotients, you know, as to whatever, you know, bound um, of order up to N. Now, this would not be such an interesting yes <laughs> if, um, Instead of this group of order 120, I had written this group of order 120. Then you wouldn't be surprised because, I mean, this, this gives you an example that would satisfy that for every n. Um, but this group here is more interesting because there is no m with this group as its fundamental group. So this is not a fundamental group of a three manifold, but and actually in what is a very precise sense, uh, there, are, there are three manifolds whose, whose fundamental group from the point of view of finite quotients, i.e. the profinite completion of their fundamental group gets arbitrarily close to this group. But yet, this group itself um, is is not a not a three manifold group. Um, and okay, uh, so I think it's a third board in there somewhere. <laughs> so. So I'll just give a little other aside. So give a little historical aside on this fact here that there is no three manifold with this group. Um, so for many, decades, people were interested in the question of, well, what finite groups themselves can actually be, um, can, can be fundamental groups of three manifolds. Um, and so Hopf in 1925 classified finite subgroups of SO4, um, and I'll call this list A, um, and so an example of a finite subgroup of SO4 is this binary icosahedral group. When you have a finite subgroup of SO4, you can take the quotient of um, S3 by that group, and you can get a three manifold that has, has that finite group as its um, fundamental group. So all of these groups that Hoff came up with, they were definitely finite groups that were um, fundamental groups of three manifolds. Um, and so from the other direction, any finite three manifold group has to have periodic cohomology of period four, where the four comes from, the, from three plus one. Um, and so Zasset House 36 and Suzuki 55 classified um, period for homology groups, so finite groups with periodic homology of period four, um, and then that is sort of an upper bound on what's possible in a finite um, 
fundamental group of a three manifold. So then we had this list B, which is an upper bound on what's possible. Of course, like list A was part of list B. Um, and then there was a lot of work um, of many mathematicians, but um, in particular, I want to point out Milner and Lee um, from the 50s through the 70s that found reasons why most of the groups that had period four cohomology um, but were not in Hoff's list of finite subgroups of SO4 could not be three manifold groups. Um, so found reasons why most of, okay, I'll call it like B set minus A. So the things in here that weren't in here uh, couldn't be. And then uh, this work sort of stalled out in the 70s with, and there was only one family left, uh, which was the generalized quaternion groups. So this is except generalized quaternion groups. So those were the only groups for which there are finite groups for which in the 70s, there was a question of like, could these finite groups be the fundamental groups of three manifolds or not? And this is one example of a generalized quaternion group. And the other examples are, are well, you can change the three and five and you can put one more cyclic group in here. And, that's, and then there's some restrictions on what these numbers can be. And those give these generalized quaternion groups um, and no more arguments were sort of found to eliminate these um, until, um, so um, Perlman in 03, when he, he proved geometrization, which in particular implied Thurston's elliptization conjecture, That said that, in fact, um, that implied that the only way to be a, um, a fundamental group of a, a finite fundamental group of a three manifold was to be a subgroup of SO4. So this implied that sort of list A was indeed the complete list. So sort of Hopf's list of finite subgroups of SO4 was the complete list of finite um, three manifold groups. And um, uh, so, in fact, the only way that we know uh, that this group is not a three manifold group is from, from Perlman's work. And what we study is, is, is I think, I mean, it's, it's quite orthogonal to, um, Certainly, it's quite orthogonal to Perlman, and it has a lot, um, a lot of connections to things that um, Milner and, and Lee were doing in the 50s and 60s. Um, but I think one thing that it sheds light on is sort of why, why these groups, uh, generalized quaternion groups, were the, the last of all, why the methods um, that people were using uh, couldn't work, and it's because of this. Um, it's because of this property, because they are in in a certain you know profinite topology on the space of profinite completions of groups. They are in the closure um, of the set of three manifold groups, and in fact, we show that that the only finite groups in the closure of the set of of three manifold groups are the actual finite groups finite three manifold groups themselves and these generalized quaternion groups. Um, uh, so they, um, so there is a sense, you know, in which they really deserve to be, they really deserve to be three manifold groups, but just somehow barely met. Um, all right, so let me then, all right, so now lots of examples. Um, say a little bit about what we do. So this question here with this star, so we, we answer okay. 
we get so those were some examples uh but this is part of a of a a, a much much bigger program so we answered this question for um every finite group g and h um you know it has to be sort of in terms of something um since obviously sometimes the answer is yes and sometimes it's no sort of in terms of the group a cohomology of these finite groups. So these were some example no and yes that we sort of picked out from our our general um, answer of the of the question. Um, and let me tell you what the a little bit about what the shape of that answer looks like. So there's two parts of it there's the like yes part and the no part all right so i'll start with uh the no <laughs> uh part um and so the no is going to come from topological obstructions to certain three manifold groups so things that we prove about you know about three manifold fundamental groups that give us things like that no um and it's all in fact um about a nice way to state it is in terms of what finite representations uh the group can have so let v be an irreducible representation of a three manifold group over a finite field and we give four um four criteria that have to be true that this representation satisfies so i'll give you yeah so the first one is that the dimension of the H1 group cohomology um, of the fundamental group on that representation has to be the same as the dimension um, of the fundamental the H1 of the fundamental group on the dual representation. So this is just the the dual representation. Um, and so this is like a this is a pretty simple fact. So both of these first two, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna state two. I'm gonna you can the our, the paper is on the archive and i just want to give you the the flavor of things and these first two are sort of pretty straightforward and they follow from poincare duality all right all right so you can think of this as being okay it had to be the, the you know it's the fundamental group of something with poincare duality so that imposes some restrictions um um uh and then the next condition, so these, these, these are um, new uh, conditions, though some, in this generality, though some special cases of these three and four um, ideas appear in some of, you know, are related to, to some of this work that was sort of eliminating some of these groups as, finite three manifold groups um, and so if v is symplectic so i.e it's a it's a representation so if it has an invariant non-degenerate alternating form um, and odd characteristic then the dimension um, I'm going to write it here, then the dimension of the H1 of this pi one of M on V has to be even, even. And so, so this is also about symplectic representations 
an even characteristic, and it also determines the parity of uh, H1, but it's more complicated how the parity is determined. So surprise, surprise, symplectic things are more complicated in even characteristic. Um, all right, so those, so those are some things um, that are, are, are true about three manifold groups. Um, and we prove those using sort of traditional algebraic topology tools, um, like we use Haggard splittings of the three manifolds and co cobordism. And, um, and we see, okay, so those are some things that have to be true about um, three manifold groups. And you could imagine, well, okay, maybe there, you know, there could be, those were four things. Maybe there's like seven more things like that or, um, um, but from the point of view of the profinite completions of three manifolds, i.e. really this, this question, question, in terms of question star, whether there's a three manifold with G as a quotient, but not H, this turns out to be the entire list of restrictions on three manifold groups. Um, and we know that because we prove sort of converse uh, theorem. So this is where, so this, um, okay, well, before I get to that, I should say, yeah. So this gives us the no answers. In particular, this three gives that, that example right above of this no, all right? Um, that's, you know, takes a little bit of, of, of playing around, um, but you need, you know, that extra factor of F3 squared you need uh, to make sure that, that um, uh, the dimension of, of pi one of M on, in fact, like this, this F3 squared um, representation uh, is is even uh, yes this is a conclusion okay so yeah yeah all right okay so we have m so m is a compact oriented three manifold and for any irreducible representation over a finite field, sort of, you know, there are four facts about its, its, its group cohomology. So these are the, con the conclusions. And these two are, I mean, anyway, these two are both just from port greater reality, and these are about the parity of H1 of pi 1 and M on V in the symplectic case. Yes. Well, you know, I mean, um, uh, you know that there is a, a map, um, uh, so it's, you, you, it's not the same, um, yeah, but you certainly use the, the map from, um, you know, uh, between the cohomology of the fundamental group and of M. Um, uh, uh, yes, and that, you know, and right, that I mean that specifically is is you know exactly how you you get the the two conditions that come from from point gray duality. Um, but this does not say this is not these these facts are um, oh these for the H one okay this involves an H two. Um, um, but maybe the H1 is the same. The H1 is the same. So this condition will be true for the, for the. Um, yeah. Um, why, why this is. M, yeah, right. Uh, because, because whether, but the, the, I think the H1, um, the H1 is the same, 
for 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 him but and these are both one so like this statement literally would have to be the same but of course this you're saying oh the statement where you have the h2 here yeah no i don't know if that is true for um for the the homology of the manifold itself with those coefficients um okay thank you all right, let me just say, so the yes, um, yeah, so how do we get the yes? Why do we, you know, why, why do we stop here? Why do we say this gives the no's? So when, I'll just, say, so when theorem one doesn't give an obstruction, we show that there exists an M, a compact oriented three manifold with pi one of M with G as a quotient, but not H. Um, all right, so uh, th this is stated a little bit informally. One way to quickly make a formal statement is um, uh, is you if you replace pi one of m with a general group, uh, say you know uh, a general group here, these conditions exactly describe the closure of the set of three manifold groups. You know their profinite completions in the space of profinite groups. So that's like one one way to to make precise this here and also I'm happy to talk about it later and the paper is on the archive um, uh, if um, you want to talk more about like what does it mean theorem one gives an obstruction but basically um, for every group that obeys these dimension properties on um, on its first group cohomology with representations in um, over finite fields um, if it if a group that obeys this is in the closure I, of the set of three manifold groups in the space of profinite groups, I will obey this property that you there are three manifolds that get arbitrarily close to that, um, uh, and that that is sort of exactly what allows you to answer this question. Just given any two groups, can you have G as a quotient um, but not H, and um, so let me say something about how we prove this um, this theorem too, um, because that's I think the you know as I said the theorem one we um, prove with more traditional tools. Oh, that's maybe not the one I wanted. <laughs> um, so we proved theorem two, we proved the existence statements. The yes is like this. I mean, for just a very concrete example, you can go to this generalized quaternion group. How do we know that there is an M um, that you know can have this quaternion generalized quaternion group as a quotient, but say no quotients of order up to a million. You could imagine, perhaps, like making some construction that can do that. I don't know how to do that, and if you can come up with a way to do that, I would love to hear if if you can do this by construction. So we do this by a probabilistic method. In particular, we don't explicitly construct these manifolds, but we look at um, three manifolds and their fundamental groups uh, in some random way in which with positive probability, uh, you will get a three manifold 
that has that property for every n. For every n, now as n gets bigger, of course, those probabilities get, get smaller. <laughs> um, all right, and so this, so how do we, how do we get these um, random three manifolds so that we can have something happen with positive probability? So Dunfield and Thurston introduced a model of random Haggard splittings. And we use that. And so we still have that picture here. Yeah, so if you look at that picture up in the top right, I said we had those two genus G handle bodies and we could build a three manifold just by identifying the surfaces of the two handle bodies by the identity map. But there's a lot of ways to identify a genus G surface with a genus G surface besides the identity map. Um, and those ways give you other three manifolds such a construction of a three manifold is called a Haggard splitting. Um, every compact oriented three manifold has a Haggard splitting. Uh, in fact, of, for each manifold, once you get to a certain genus, uh, i.e. the genus of the handle body for, every, for that genus and every genus higher, you can build that three manifold um, by identifying two handle bodies. So now um, we uh, use a, um, a, a, an arbitrary random identification of the genus G surfaces to glue. And those are parameterized, essentially the different ways that you can do that to get different three manifolds are parameterized by the mapping class group of a surface of genus G. So we glue with a random element of the mapping class group of genus G. And um, how do you get a random element of the mapping class group? It turns out that it doesn't matter too much. Um, and in fact, we, um, um, we show that if you take any set of generators of um, the mapping class group and you take a long random walk in those generators so that you're reasonably seeing a lot of the mapping class group um, that this, uh, this construction will work. So, um, so this gives a way uh, to produce random three manifolds and all of the three manifolds. And what we actually show, we give um, as the genus of the handle bodies goes to infinity, um, the distribution of the profinite completions of the three manifold groups. So basically the data of what finite groups it has as quotients and not. Um, and so we give that in, in formulas uh, and one corollary of the formulas that we give for the distribution is that sort of when this is how we, we get theorem two, so when theorem one doesn't say no, there is a positive probability that our random M you know, gives, gives a yes answer, i.e. has G as a quotient, but not H. And in this model, for example, 100% um, are um, asymptotically 100% of these are hyperbolic three manifolds. So one has hyperbolic examples. Um, and, and so that is now, and there I sweep under the rug 
most of the, the work <laughs> and the interesting new things, which um, uh, has a lot to do with our work on the moment problem for random groups, which is how we are able to produce these formulas um, for the distribution of pi one of M. So that's sort of what goes, you know, goes a, a lot of what goes into being able to do this is, is our work on being able to produce formulas for um, distributions of groups from just knowing certain averages over those distributions. Um, so that's what we call the moment problem for groups. And uh, we, we, we use that here to, to prove the probabilistic yeses. Um, all right, and um, I'll just also give sort of one other corollary of these formulas, just to give you a sense of what some of the formulas look like. Um, and also, um, if you squint enough, this is, you know, I said we we're interested in these questions for curves over finite fields and to make conjectures over a number of fields. Like this is roughly what all of these, the sort of rough shape of, of the formulas in all of these cases. Um, so if S is a finite set of primes, so here's one example formula. So in the limit is the genus goes to infinity in this model of random Haggard splittings. Um, the probability that the fundamental group has no S group quotients. So uh, S group is like a P group, except S is a finite set of primes. So that means a group whose only, the only primes that divide the order of the group are in S. Um, so this, we're gonna give a formula uh, as an example for this probability from this model of a random three manifold. It's the product over primes in S of j at least one of one plus p to the minus j to the minus one. So as you put in more primes, that's getting smaller. And then that, what looked like some kind of Euler product is actually secretly um, a product over the finite simple abelian groups. And we need to include the non-abelian finite simple groups. So the other part of the product is over the non-abelian simple S groups. Um, uh, and it's E to the minus uh, the second group homology known as the Schur multiplier of that group over the size of the outer automorphism group of the finite simple group. Um, so that gives you a sense of like what the sort of formulas look like. And then when you see something like this and you're like, oh, okay, that's a positive number, then you get, um, you get the existence side of our theorems. All right, thank you. Oh, yeah, why is that not zero? Um, well, you can, yeah, I don't, this is a good question. I don't know if you can know that without classification, like certainly without classification, sorry, certainly with classification over all the finite simple groups, you can compute this and, you know, um, uh, yeah, but, um, yeah, right. And it's, 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 even if you take this over all the non abelian simple groups, it's, it's not zero by classification. Um, I don't know. It must be, I just have a finite set of primes. I don't know. It's a great question. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. If we can see, if we, if we know about finite simple groups that there are without classification, that say there are only finite many for a given S. Yes. 
So the, uh, the groups in list A you said are yeah. isolated. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, inside the space of profinite. Yeah. Well, every finite group, is, yeah, is is isolated. Uh, um, oh, I thought the ones in list the, the generalized quaternions were were not. Is that right? Oh, you mean ah? Uh, I see. Okay, all the the set of all finite groups is like isolated, or, you know, it's discrete in the in the in the set of groups. But you're saying in the set of three manifold groups, including the infinite ones, um, um, well, actually, you know, these, I mean, these will all and like if you took these other groups, these groups in list A, they will also be. Limit points. Oh, okay. okay. They will also be limit points. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so mm -hmm. then, could you just repeat what what is exceptional about the generalized quaternion group from your point of view? You said it had some feature that. Well, it has some feature that I guess the point is the only other groups with that feature are the groups in list A. Okay. Okay. So, right. I, yeah. I see. so somehow those generalized quaternion groups and the groups in list A are exactly the finite groups that that you know can be approached okay. by by three manifold groups I mean, and and that's sort of what they have in common and somehow these methods like weren't distinguishing between that and being a three manifold group yeah and can you see from that fact that they can be approached by three manifold groups that they have peer, for periodic cohomology um Well, hmm. I guess you're saying without knowing what groups can be approached, if you just knew, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think so, because I think you can detect, yeah, well, no, I guess not, a, that's a good question, For, can you see, I don't know. Uh, that's a good. That's a good question. If you can just sort of prove that directly, I don't. That, that's that. Yeah, I don't know. The, mm -hmm. the thing you want is to have C and not H, and here you consider only one group. So, or can you restrict to only the random thing for which G appears to prove that H will not appear? Um. Uh, Well, maybe, maybe to say that, that that's not part to say how it goes, but to to, to say to, if you want to know about G and H, you can take. Uh, a sort of a pro completion of your group that only asks about G quotients and H quotients and maybe the other groups to, you have to throw in, they call like the variety of, of groups uh, that you can get as sub quotients and things to make a nice pro completion. And then um, uh, what we do is, so if you look at that pro completion, sort of the smallest pro completion of your group that you need that only cares about G or H, we then give, formulas for every possible like pro gh completion of what the probability is that you get that 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 completion and the formulas the way that in which we write you can you tell if they are zero or not and then um and then and it's basically in terms of these Exactly these criteria, whether they're zero or not, and so that is that is how the answer comes about when when you know of those um, of those sort of pro GH groups. If you if one of them that has choose a portion but not H has a positive probability, um, then uh, then the answer is yes. And um, yeah, and in these. Yeah, and in the formulas, I mean, this one is sort of simple enough. You know, th there are the formulas are on this general shape, and but then sometimes you have like a an, something here which is going from a dimension of some h one to another h one, and 
sometimes this is a minus sign and when those go through zero then it's zero and it's sort of very uh you know it's not a complicated question when the formulas are zero or not so that's kind of how we we unravel it back to just those conditions yeah. but there are infinitely many uh, such uh or find that possible goals under which one need v and h so yes only some of them you will care about Right, so there are, there are there are infinitely many, but the question that you, sort of you care about is is of, of those, you know, they're the ones that have G as a quotient, but say not H. And what you're the question that you're asking is like, do all of those have have probability zero, or does at least one of them them not? And that um, yeah, and that you can answer in terms of these just these things about the, the size of the of the H1 and actually H2 comes into the, the second <laughs> criteria. Yes. So a manifold can have many different heat guard splitting. Yes. So when you're doing these probabilities, are you taking like, are you counting them as like the same two different heat guard splittings of, the, of an isomorphic manifold? Or are they sort of counted separately in these? Yeah, that's a great question. And then this is really, random Hagrid splittings in that it's really every Hagrid splitting is is counted um, uh, separately. Um, now for an existence result, um, sure. doesn't matter. <laughs> um, uh, though it's a um, uh, yeah, the, you can see, for example, that like no, you were worried that this was somehow too biased, you know, no three manifold occurs with positive probability in this model, uh, for example. Um, but actually, and this is, a, I think, a very interesting question. I would certainly conjecture, um, and there are reasons to believe from other kind of universality results about distributions of groups, that you would see this same, um, same distribution in other models um, of random three manifolds that see all the three manifolds in some kind of reasonable way, but um, that's I think that's an interesting open question. Can I ask a follow-up? Okay. I'm just curious, like, do, do you think that'll affect like how the convergence goes? Like, I mean, I'm not uh, sure if it's clear or not from this case. Like, if you bound the genus of the Hagar splitting. Like, do you expect the probability to be less than this number, or bigger than this number? I'm not entirely sure what you expect. And do you think that depends on like how you count the Hagar splittings? Yeah, the convergence absolutely could depend on the model. I would expect, and um, uh, um, yeah. So, so that yeah, and that is a question we have not have not thought much about in this setting. Um, yeah, but the, but convert, I mean, in the analogous like number field setting, and people are sometimes thinking about like secondary terms and so forth, um, uh, those, those kinds of things I think often are, are less robust than this main term and, and can depend on the, the model. Thanks. All right, uh, we have a break till 2.30 for lunch. Thank you, Melanie.